Now, Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Yeah, let's get it. let's get right into it. Fresh off our big interview with Uncle Ted last week, we're stoked to be talking to Jason Hartless, who's performing drums on this record. Brand new album comes out next year. You can pre-order it now wherever music is sold. Uh, Detroit Muscle is the title. Welcome to the show, Mr. Jason Hartless. There he is, everybody. Look at him. Hey, you know? pleasure to be here. And he did Going his hair sure. for us, Mitch. At least somebody did today. <laughs> Listen, I did my hair too. It's it's all gone. <laughs> yeah, I noticed. Ah, uh, so so Jason, let me talk to you about this because you got started super super early in your career. So before we get to this Ted Nugent thing, um, talk to me about the fact that at five years old you were playing drums well enough to have Corky Lang of Mountain call you up because at five, you know, I was barely walking and my kids certainly weren't doing anything as <laughs> as good as drumming. How'd you talk to me about that at the beginning? Well, you know, um, I was born into a musical family. Uh, right. My dad was a professional drummer. Um, and before I was born, you know, he used to tour, his band used to tour a lot with Ace Fraley. And, um, and oh, wow. he became very close with, with the Ace and Richie Scarlett, Ace's guitar player, um, yeah. that Richie became my godfather when I was born. So, um, you know, growing up, the drums were always in the house. So, you know, I just kind of taken a liking to it. And, um, you know, it's funny because, you know, at first my dad wanted me to be a hockey player, you know. Uh, like every other dad. Yeah, yeah right. You know, I kind of still dad. hope you do. <laughs> I would love, I'm, I'm a huge hockey fan, but unfortunately, my, uh -huh. my luck, I'd break my hand or something. But Go Habs, go. Uh, so go Leafs, go. But, Whoa. Uh, oh, okay oh, all right we're done all right that was done. fun thank hang you very up, much no. hang up <laughs> go leaves come on you're from detroit at least at least red wings well of course uh, okay. red wings right. is number one leaves are number two but since you know montreal <laughs> i gotta gotta throw that one out there oh my god my, my heart's hurting <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ooh, okay. but you know uh <laughs> it's you know but i always gravitated towards um towards the drums and you know i'd kind of you know, crawl on his kit and play around, bang around. And then, right. you know, by the time I can get up on the kit on my own, my dad started, you know, bringing some of his buddies over and, and jamming with me. And so by the time I was five, I started playing cover gigs around Detroit, you know, with an all adult band. <laughs> and, um, and when Ace Fraley rejoined Kiss, um, Richie ended up going to play bass for Mountain. Right. And I was a big mountain fan, love Corky's playing. And um, when I was doing these cover gigs, we used to play Nantucket Sleigh Ride and Mississippi Queen. And I, I had to have been about six or so. Um, Corky seen a video of me playing Nantucket Sleigh Ride and called my dad and was like, hey, look, I, w I would love to work with this kid. So um, around the time I was seven till about nine-ish years old um Corky would he was living in Toronto at the time would drive to and from to Detroit and we would work in a recording studio on um you know a solo album but you know mm -hmm. really it was it was mainly a, a way for Corky to mentor me and, and teach me you know um how to be a studio musician and how to you know act professional in the studio and and things like that so you know I was very lucky to have had these people around me at such a young age and you know, as, as time went on, you know, more and more things led to another and, you know, here we are. Wow. That's crazy. I mean, you know, just thinking about, I mean, was your dad probably your biggest influence when it comes to being behind the skins? Yeah. You know, if, if, when he was, when I was little, he, you know, he used to, used to sit me up on his lap and, and bang away. And, and, but, you know, luckily I've always had these parents that um, never forced me to do anything you know, never were, you know, you need to go practice, right. um, which unfortunately is, is a major, major issue with most, you know, young quote unquote prodigy musicians or, you know, whatever talent mm -hmm. that they might have. So I was able to find a love for the instrument on my own. And it wasn't forced and, on you. Exactly. You know, and, um, you know, I was, if anything, my, uh, the business end of things is what my dad forced, uh, me to make sure I understood, but I never know. once, you know, with uh, music side of things. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, like even my friends and I, I mean, like, you know, back in elementary school when we were five or six, you know, every Saturday morning, they, my parents would wake all of us up and we'd have to go to do, you know, play hockey. We were in mag one or mag two. And it's like, we're all dreading having to get up early because the practice for the mag is at like seven in the morning. It's just like, 
and it was always forced on us. And we we're just like, you know, like, had we just found it organically, I probably would have been way more into it, which is how right. I found music organically. And then I'm super committed to it. So it's like that makes it makes sense that, you know, you're like, it wasn't necessarily forced upon you. And then you just fell in love with it on your own. Yeah. Yeah, you know, my dad is a is is very much of a music encyclopedia, you know, in terms of he listens to every genre of music and, you know, yeah. so he was very influential in exposing me to many, many different artists and, you know, what would lead to my initial influences as a musician. Um, and then as I got older, I started branching out and, you know, finding my own thing. Yeah. It, so let me take, sort of talk about the business side here, because you're also the manage, managing partner at The Orchard, which is a, a Sony property. Uh, talk to me about where you want to go with your career. Do you want to be the, the, the studio musician, that drummer, or do you want to get into artist management, or label management? Where, where do you sort of see your future going? Well, I'm, I'm very lucky. Um, I graduated... Um... Uh, about a year and a half ago from Berkeley College of Music um, right. with a music business degree. How was and, that experience, uh, by the way? It was it was interesting because um, I I went from you know just being this touring guy and studio guy, which you know is is my number one passion. I love being that guy that you know will go from playing on a, a, a metal record to turning around to playing on a big band Christmas album. Right. You right. know, and and. Um, I, I, I learned as, you know, as, as a hired gun musician, you know, you're not always going to be, you know, that, that, that you're not always going to be working, you know, you're going to have that downtime between tours or between sessions, you know, and I found a love for um, running a record label and doing music industry stuff. And uh, right around the time I, I started my degree, um, a label that I had worked with as a musician um, approached me and was like, all right, well, our, our label's been kind of defunct. We've got a bunch of catalog stuff just generating revenue. You know, see what you can do with it. Um, so, you know, I was named a partner of Prudential Music Group, um, which is a subsidiary of Sony Orchard. And, um, you know, we've been able to grow this company into one of the largest um, vinyl reissue and vinyl wow. um, labels in the United States. And, you know, we, we control all the back catalog of, you know, bands like The Sweet um, wow. and, and um, a bunch of other artists like that. So, you know, that really keeps me busy. That's my quote unquote, you know, day gig, you know, in between sessions and tours. And, you know, I absolutely love it because, you know, it takes all my, my you know, 20 plus years of being in the industry as a musician and you know you utilizing that that knowledge and stuff elsewhere mm -hmm. you know plus uh, you know it kind of it brings a little bit different creative side to things yeah and uh, you know just wow. to go back onto that point you know with all that experience in the music biz being the hired guy being the hired gun and being on the road and i mean like, you basically were living it whereas why do you feel the need to go to berkeley and get that diploma and get that degree because you know i always go back to the old saying those who can't do teach Right. And yet you were already doing. Right. Well, you know, it's it's uh, I've, I've taken a very anti music performance uh, education when it comes to college, mm. um, because I, I, I personally feel that that degree is something that you don't need to go to college for. Right. Right. You know, right. there's never once been a, a touring musician that got hired because they went to Berkeley as a musician. You know, um, you, maybe in the symphonic, you know, scene or sometimes jazz back in the day. But either way, you know, I, I taking the business approach, you know, again, it, it it's a different situation as a musician. Right. You know, if I want to you if I want to learn something, you know, that, you know, I don't I'm not too familiar with when it comes to my playing, I'll find a, a drum teacher or I'll contact some of my friends and like, hey, how are you doing this? What are you doing? You know, I, I really don't see the need to go to college for that because you find that in, you know, in, in the real world, yeah. whereas opposed to music business, there's a lot more of a uh, there's a lot more standards and practices that are right. involved in that sort of thing. So going to college for that or, you know, even music production, same thing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that you can't really you learn in the real world unless you're actively doing it day to day. Now, gotcha. I was lucky that I was able to do it day to day and go to college at the same time. 
It's amazing because if you look at Jeremy over here, he got into radio at what, 14, 15 and yeah. didn't do any university or anything and just, well, you know, I, I, the talent I mean, took over. Out of all the people that we've ever interviewed, I mean, like 90% of the time they talk about, you know, how we hired somebody to be in the band. And it's like, well, I'll be honest with you, the hang is the most important thing. Yeah, he plays a good drum fill. Yeah, he does the guitar parts. Great. But, you know, if I can hang out with the guy, you know, the 95% of the other time that we're not on the stage, uh, it's not going to be a good time. Exactly. And, and that's and that's why, you know, at the end of the day, there's guys out there that are better than you, just as good as you or worse than you that have bigger gigs than you yeah you know right. because they might be you know like you know because you're you're living on a tour bus with these guys you know for weeks and months on end if if you can't live with them then psh, they're gone they're gone yeah so let me just quickly ask you about ted and the new album because every time i interview ted i get a lot of hate on twitter a lot of hate on facebook how dare you you're in a, and it's like well you know what it's just about having a conversation. We can have a conversation. We don't have to agree on absolutely everything. How is it for you? Do you have other bands that say, oh, no, 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 he's worked with Ted, not not touching him. He's toxic. Or is it like, oh, he's working with Ted. He's a classic artist. Come on. How is it for you? Because for me, it's it's some it's a little bit of hate sometimes. There's absolutely no negativity in my perspective wow. um, because musicians, you know, they understand Ted has always had top notch musicians in his right. 50 plus years of being a musician. You know, he's a, yeah. he, he holds himself to a certain standard and he always lives by that. So, you know, it's been a, it's been a great thing. And my life changed overnight, you know, when I joined the Nugent band, because I got instant kind of gratification, you know, for other gigs. You know, and I've gotten a lot of work because of, you know, I play with Nugent and things like that. So, right, you know, right. but I, I, I can't ask for a better, you know, guy to work for. He has treated myself like family. He's treated my family like his family. You know, he is just a absolutely stand up guy and just a, a amazing person to work with. Now, in terms of a Detroit muscle, when you come to lay down the drums on that, do you go back to the early 70s records of Ted and say, OK, we got to recapture this kind of sound? Or do you just say, I'm Jason. I'm going to play what I play. And Ted will tell me if he likes it or not. I actually, you know, there was a certain flair that Cliff Davies, the, the original drummer that played yep. on all the iconic stuff captured, you know, so um, for this record in particular, and the last record we did music made me do it. Um, I, we did a little bit of that, but this record um, more specifically, there was this vintage sound and vintage vibe that was kind of going on you know mm -hmm. we recorded the entire record in four days that's the and, way you do it um yeah. and, and that's that's writing it recording it everything and um we sat down and and we actually recorded it in ted's barn in jackson michigan you know so they brought all this vintage neve gear so it's it's very old school recording wise by the way you just turned on uh, jeremy with the word neve to, 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 <laughs> what he said neve i'm an yeah. ssl guy sorry <laughs> <laughs> um so you know we 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 went the very very old school approach and you know we all sat down and um you know we hashed out these songs maybe over a day and then right. you know mm -hmm. probably over five six hours over two days we recorded the whole you know wow. drums bass and and rhythm guitar and then ted did you know all the extra solos and stuff like that but it is an extremely old school record. I mean, everybody that's heard the record so far says that this is this captures 1978 Nugent. You know, the 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 licks that he's he came up with are just absolutely vintage classic. You know, Ted Nugent that no one else can come up with. Right. And um, you know, but we he allows us to do basically you know whatever we need for the song because you know very very rarely does he you know say you know try this try that because he knows that what we are going to bring to the table is what you know makes the song you know what it needs to be talking about that i mean with your performance on the records and stuff do you have a say in the tone of your drums like say you do a session then you get a mix back and it's like all of a sudden you got this big cannonball snare and you got some simmons sample replacements on your toms like do you have any say in the sound of the the tone of your drums or yes um yeah. And actually, uh, uh, I kind of in in the background co-produced this record with Ted and okay, cool. uh, Michael Lutz. 
and work closely with the engineers and uh, mixing engineers to to really make sure that this thing sounded exactly how it should be. And, um, you know, Andy Padlin, who um, engineered and mixed this, just did a phenomenal job. And his brother, Tim Padlin, engineered it as well. But um, we, we did a lot of kind of fine tuning and tweaking. And, you know, I used all vintage Pearl drums. Um, you know, Greg was using, you know, a vintage, uh, um, vintage Fender bass. And, you know, so it was all, and actually Ted was using Jimmy McCarty's Fender twin that he recorded on all. Yeah, the he was writers. telling us about that. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's all the gear was old school the recording techniques were old school, you know, and I think it definitely reflects on, uh, on the final product, but pro tools was still the tape machine. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But, talking about that though. I mean, like, you know, being sort of, you know, executive producer, producer on the project like that. I mean, do you guys have a, a production meeting beforehand and talk about the, the sonic landscape of what you're going to end up creating? Do you say, hey, you know, you go and listen to some modern rock radio and see what's going on over there to try and keep it around, you know, what's happening today? Or do you try and recreate a nostalgic kind of sound to it? Is there, do you guys have that kind of meeting or? Every, every record that Nugent will do, it will end up being Ted Nugent. You know, it yeah. doesn't matter you know, where it's recorded, how it's recorded. At the yeah, but if he the, comes in, he's like, all right, listen, I heard this like really cool program part. We need to program some drums on here. Like he would never do that. He looks at it. He looks at it as he just wants to make sure it's captured perfectly. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and um, him and I, about, about a year and a half ago, I met him for some sushi at a, at a restaurant in Jackson, Michigan. And, and he was asking me about, you know, so is there really a difference between vintage neve stuff or just going right into pro tools you know and it's it's coming from his his mindset of always you know working on tape machines and and you know getting those those iconic sounds back in the 70s you know i find that there's the happy medium nowadays we have that luxury that we can you know blend the vintage stuff with the modern stuff you right. know i yeah. i would love to, to cut on tape but at the end of the day is it practical in 2021 not really you know, yeah. can you have stuff that emulates the exact same sound or pretty close to it? Absolutely. Yeah, you throw your Eddie Kramer tape emulation on there and you're, you're you know, <laughs> you're, you're good to go. Exactly. But it's interesting you talk about that because, I mean, you know, even look at the Orchards, you know, uh, lineup of artists. I mean, you got people like Jack White, who is a straight up analog through, through and through guy. And then you've got artists, you know, like Charlotte Carday, I mean, who is just a total modern day pop star which is all programming and Pro Tools. So it's like, it's interesting how you kind of have all the ends of the spectrum in a way, you know? Exactly. And I think that, you know, in 2021, that's how it should be. You know, you, yeah. you, you can't have, you know, you can't be really focused on one thing. But at, this, at the same time, I had a meeting with someone earlier this week and I was telling them like, you know, with the rock genre itself, look in the last 10 years, there's been almost no new artists in the last 10 years. Right. You know, yeah. Greta Van Fleet, it, the you know, struts, probably, probably, you know, the struts, but the struts have been, you know, they've been doing that since late 2000s. Kicking yeah. around, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, there isn't, there isn't anything new within that. So, you know, for myself as a hired gun musician, it's like, okay, well, what do I do? You know, right. go to the country stuff, go to the pop stuff, go to, you know, whatever, whatever genre, you know, is, is, is out there, you know, always take those opportunities. And, Unfortunately, there's a lot of musicians that, you know, they have to stay within their lane. They're one track minded and they're like, well, I only want to do what I do. It's like, that's fantastic. It's awesome. You know, but it limits you. you want to do. Enjoy working yeah. at Home Depot. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, let me ask you about that just real quick, because Ted is going to retire. I mean, it, you know, Alice Cooper, Ted, Kiss, five, five years from now, seven years from now, they're, they're gone. So what is plan B for you? Do, do you do the Jason Heartless band? Do you try to find the, you know, do you go play drums for Pink? Like, where do you see, or do you just say, you know what, I'll be a producer. Let me go produce. Yeah. Whatever the next gig is. You know? Whatever and, it is. And luckily, you know, Nugent, we haven't worked since 2019. You know, we did the record this year, but we haven't toured since, I think our last show was August 31st of 2019. Then, mm -hmm. you know, the whole world went to hell. But, um you know, last year I was touring with the 90s band Sponge for about a year. And That's then right. this summer I um, went on tour with uh, the band Pop Evil, which is more modern. Yeah, it's a know, great band. 
Toxic, great band. And because their drummer, she was stuck in England. So they brought me on for the first month of the tour. So, you know, luckily I, I, I get those calls and, and able to continue, um, you know, working with Nugent's not out. And, you know, at the end of the day, Nugent, we only work, you know, six, seven weeks out of the year anyways, you know, right. so keep long hunting my, season. Yeah. <laughs> so keeping the rest of my, my, uh, my year busy is, is always my, my number one priority. Yeah. Talk okay. about the, um, I was going to say, talk about the vinyl business just really quick. Cause I was reading this article courtesy of the hustle.co and they were talking about how the insane resurgence of vinyl records are actually, it's, it's, it's outselling pretty much everything, but the industry can't keep up with the demand. Have you seen production issues in the last I little deal while? with it. I deal with it on a daily basis. Really? Uh, because our, our primary business is vinyl. Um, you know, we are, we're, we're partnered with third man pressing in Detroit, Jack White's vinyl facility. Yeah. Um, and we were the first third party label to be working with them. Cause we're 15 minutes from, from the plant. But, wow. um, when we were working on our record store day releases for 2022, back in August, um, every single pressing facility in the United States and Canada could not fulfill our order for April. And this was in, wow. Um, it's, it, you know, we went from usually a three to four month ish turnaround to now about eight to 10 month turnaround. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's due to the supply chain issues in, you know, the United States on top of, um, the, one of the major vinyl acetate um, manufacturers burned down in California yeah. a couple of years ago. So now the stock is running low. So there's, there's a lot of different, you know, factors that are playing into it. Yes. They, you know, they are outselling, but at the same time, that's not really the big problem that we find. We find that it's just the supply chain, you know, right. and you know, the, the workers working at the facilities. And does that drive ultimately the price of the records up as well? I haven't seen it yet. Um, we, we, we don't. Um, and I just, you know, across the board, there really hasn't been a inflation in, in vinyl prices. I mean, the vinyl prices for the last 10 years have kind of stayed around the same 20 to $35. They've, they've already yeah. been at max level. That's yeah. why there's no, yeah. depending, no place depending to on your, depending yeah. on, you know, what, what release it is. Yeah. But, if you're getting um, a double LP gatefold record package, I mean, yeah, you're going to pay 40 bucks for it. 45 bucks, you know, exactly. But why do you, why do you think people are coming back to vinyl? I mean, for the longest time it was Apple iTunes mastered for iTunes. Oh, CDs are done. Vinyls. Are done. It's all digital, digital streaming, but now people are coming back to the physical product. Why do you think that is? Well, you know, it, there, there's a there's a certain kinesthetic quality to a vinyl record. You yeah. know, um, you're physically holding something. Number one, you know, it's not an NFT, and, yeah. and, and um, it's a non feelable token. That's what I call them. Right. <laughs> um, and you know, it's an art piece. You know, you're getting a, a, a eleven by eleven or whatever. You know, the size. You know, is you're getting something that you can frame if you want. You know, you're you're physically taking a disc and putting it on the thing. You're physically putting it on the needle on the record, you know. And if you're you know you're an audiophile or you know, have a couple extra bucks, don't buy the hundred dollar, you know, Crosley, the Crosley record. The Ronco. Don't but don't don't get the Ronco, get the real yeah. thing. <laughs> the the cheap one, you pay a hundred bucks more and you get an audio technica one that's fantastic, yeah. you know. And it's just the 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 sound of it is so much warmer. You know, if you clean your records and you keep them up, you know, um, we, we get all of our vinyl mastered at master disc in, in New York, you know, master disc is, you know, never yeah, Scott Hall, man. He's the Scott man. Hall. Is Bob Ludwig yeah. still mastering these days. Yeah. Bob Ludwig has his own place up in Maine and right. Scott, um, Scott's bought... the man over there at master disc. Yep. Yeah. We've, we've been working with Scott for many years and he's just the, the, the absolute best. 100 percent. okay so then because i'm i'm a cd guy i mean I, i've got a whole bunch of cds lying around here mm -hmm. where do you see cd going because it, it still has a significant portion of the market it's still doing you know uh, what was it 16 million dollars in sales or something i mean it's not nothing i mean it's not like it was in 1989 but it's, it's not nothing do you see it disappearing is is it is there going to be a resurgence because a CD is five bucks and vinyl is 40? Where are we on that? So, you know, I, I find that to be a, a, just a, it can go either way. I don't think it'll ever resurgence like vinyl did. 
right you know because it's it's such a, a unique medium it's not like a vinyl record where it's this large thing right. you know cd can be thrown away instantly um mm -hmm. now what we do is we because when we first started doing vinyl we were doing the digital download cards and we were like oh this will be you know people get the the digital thing for the vinyl with the vinyl mm -hmm. they didn't want that you know we we always got where's a cd where's a cd so now we're manufacturing um, what I call mini LP CDs, which was a big thing in Japan. Mm -hmm. And all it is, is it's a, you know, the, um, the cardboard uh, jackets, just yep. like a vinyl record, but it's right. a CD. And the artwork on the CD is the label of the vinyl. So oh, wow. we basically yeah, I have a lot of those. They're, those are the, the the mini LPs from Japan. They are fantastic. I've got all the Def Leppards, the Brian Adams, the Rat. They are great. That's really cool. I didn't even know about that. Oh, I'll show you some the next time you come over. They're great. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, and it's 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 inexpensive, but you know, the the consumer is able to get the CD because we just package it directly with the vinyl. Yep. So they're getting the vinyl, they're getting the CD. You the, get the booklet. The manufacturing cost is not that much, you know, for us on the CD. So we're not like, hey, we're gonna press ten thousand CDs and then sell a hundred of them. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, we only sell what we're gonna sell with the vinyl um and we, honestly we, in this day and age it's it's all about the cross collateration of the brand itself mm -hmm. you know we with the suite in particular you know we do these these big packages of vi uh, vinyl cd with merchandise and reproductions of old tickets and uh, programs from their 70s tours and right. you know, things like that because that's what the consumer wants they want this they want you know more bang for their buck and yeah. They want something cool like that. They want a cool poster that they could put up on their wall. That's a replicate, you know, replica of yep. something from the seventies or, yeah, or like, old tour like, book or, you know, so it's, old it's laminates and backstage passes. And yeah, just look at what white snake does with their box sets. I mean, they have nailed the whole concept. You've got the, the, the tour program, you know, reproduced in a small form. You've got those, the, 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 the mini LP sleeves. Mm -hmm. I mean, the White Snake folks just, you know, Coverdale just have nailed it. It's perfect. Yeah, I mean, because it's, it's, you know, look at the Kiss 45th anniversary box set for Destroyer. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. They did all of the, the replica of, of you yeah. know, tickets and all this, all this crap. Because it's, number one, you can, you can sell it for a premium. But number two, the, that's what the fans want. You know, they yeah. want the super cool thing, not just the music. You've heard the music a thousand times. Right. So let's get something that's going to help you. You know help the fan want it more by the third or fourth edition of that re-release <laughs> you know? listen it's the way to do it hey just before yeah. we before we start wrapping up here you also played with insane clown posse <laughs> I, i'm interested in woo, woo. yeah i'm interested in that because that's from my perspective from what i see in the media it's a whole lot of nuts <laughs> it's just nuts but is it really nuts or are they just a band that does a show and it's just part of the it's just part of the show like what was that like honestly i can't tell you because i cut the track for them on their latest record in my home studio so <laughs> um so I, I i never met the guys but I, oh, wow. know, they, are, they are local detroit boys as well um and and i know a lot of people that do know them and you know they're these guys are straight businessmen you know they've got a warehouse in metro detroit that's just stocked full with all their merchandise and they do a lot of volume you know nice. so big big you know big uh, kudos to those guys to to you know create a brand and create a market you know it's it's funny i you know i don't really listen to their music but um i did this track for them probably a year ago and didn't really think nothing of it just sent it off and then that was it and um my 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 sister is a insane clown posse fan and, and she, <laughs> we'll forgive her <laughs> she had no she had no idea that i even played on on their new record i didn't even know it was going to be on their new record it was just like mm -hmm. here's you know a demo or whatever nice. and um and, and she was you know she came over the house and was talking about it and i was like wait a minute let me let me see the track listing of this record <laughs> and, and i looked and oh I guess I'm on the new and you're and you're like oh you 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 see that name see that name you see, see that name yeah that's my name oh, that's my name that is great he gets to flex in front of his sister that is yep. beautiful it's like hey so that's so then let me ask you this since you're playing on you know the tantric warrior so mountain uh, Richie Scarlet uh, Ted 
How do you approach it? Do you do you is it do they just get Jason the drummer or do you really go learn their music and get into it and try new cha chas and you know how do you sort of approach all of that? Uh, they get whatever drummer they need. I look at right, it. and that's the way it has to be. And, and that's what Eric uh, Singer does. Exactly, you know. Yeah. And Eric actually, Eric called me yesterday. He's a very very dear friend of mine, and he's been an amazing uh, mentor for mm -hmm. me since I was about. I know Eric, Eric. Look at I got Larry right next to me. I got my Eric Singer snare. <laughs> oh, right on, right on. <laughs> I just happen to have it next to me. I'm not even joking. That's hilarious. Right. That's yeah, great. I mean, Eric is Eric's been a, a very, very good friend of mine since I was about seven years old and right. you know, kind of mentored me coming up. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's the same thing. You know, it's it's what Eric does, you know, whatever guy you need, what, you know, Jeff Beccaro, what Vinny Caliuta, what Steve Gadd, what all these classic, iconic studio musicians did and do that's what i i try to cater myself after it you know it's mm -hmm. you know and i have told the story a, a, a bunch of times but you know i was on tour with joe lynn turner you know yeah. playing rainbow and deep purple songs and literally got on a plane flew back home to detroit went straight to the studio and recorded a, a big band christmas album with guys from bob Seeger's band you know? <laughs> nice so it's like it's it's night and day thing but to me that's what i love about doing what I do is every session's different every gig's right. different you know and and it kind of goes back to you know what we're working with Nugent is every gig's different you know we we go on 10 minute improvised jams on during Wang Dang Sweet Poon Tang or you know good friends in a bottle line or whatever and right. yeah. it, it's old school there's no click there's no backing tracks there's no you know Ted counts off every single song so if he's feeling good one night it might be a little bit faster if he's you know, uh, tired from the show before, it's going to be a little bit slower. Yeah. You know, and it, it just keeps it real and organic. But with that being said, you know, it's I've worked with artists that you know do the backing tracks and the click track, and it's it's whatever the person that's hiring me needs me to do, I will do. And this yeah. is why he will be the Steve Lucas there of drummers for years to come. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Jason, That's before we wrap up, I got one last question for you because we're talking, just to go back to the vinyl thing. Yeah. Because I've always been curious about this, and you're probably a really good person to ask. When you have the CD version, and then you've also got the vinyl version, then you've got the iTunes version, the streaming version, are they all mastered differently, or is it all the same version that's put on all the different pieces? Um, it depends on, on who's doing it. Um, for us, yes, a little bit. Um, because when, when you're... When you're having, you know, uh, a vinyl record made, it gets, you know, the, the lacquer gets cut. So who's ever mastering that, you know, it might do a small little tweaks. And we usually have Scott Hall at Master Disc do small little, you know, little added tweaks that I know that it's not going to sound the same on vinyl than it will digital. Mm -hmm. So maybe adding a little extra high end or taking out high end or low end or whatever. You know, so there are small differences and, and that's why people collect um, mainly 70s and 80s. You know, they collect different um, pressings from different pressing plants because they're all cut different mastering engineers, you know, especially you, know, you get into like Beatles and, and people buy, you know, this vinyl record because, you know, this one is is more, you know, mastered with better low end or, or whatever. So, right. It all depends, um, especially this day and age, it's a little bit easier to, to get away with um, changing something slightly because we can, because we're working on digital files versus if we were working with analog tape. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I try, I try to, to make sure that the digital sounds best for digital and the vinyl says sounds best for vinyl. Yeah. But I, I have to say, I buy a lot of the deluxe reissues of bands and uh, sometimes i have the old version and the new versions they're, they're they're so compressed it's like it's like mastered for itunes but thrown on cd in a lot of the cases and it, it drives me nuts there's one band that did a 20th anniversary edition of an album and then the 30th the the 20th is is beautiful and then the 30th it's like oh it sounds great in my airpods like brick walled right. and yeah it's so so there 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 is some do it right some are lazy like any any business right i mean you know it, yeah it, but you're, you're actually sending it off to an actual engineer it's just not like an ai program mastering your stuff and then being <laughs> put up on streaming no. <laughs> exactly and exactly. if scott hall touches it you know it's fucking gonna be brilliant it's exactly just, 
He, uh, he, I did a kiss tribute uh, in 2013 for um, a cancer charity and Scott mastered it for me. Oh, because uh, you work with Chuck Alcazian. I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Chuck is, is one of my best friends. Pearl yeah. Sound Studios is my, my home base. Yeah. And, and, and that's what we ended up getting a Chuck. Well, Chuck helped me out, get some of the artists on there. Anyway, we raised a whole bunch of money for this cancer. You had charity. everybody on there. You had Eric Singer. You had everybody. I didn't have Eric on there. I had, I uh, had Eric. no, no, no. I had uh, Troy Lucetta. I had oh. Jeff, uh, Jeff Labar. I had uh, Bumblefoot. I had a whole bunch of people, but they, they came in just all sounding completely different. There was 40 songs and they all sound. And I sent it all to Scott and it came back as a whole unit. And you just went, Oh, Wow. So that's okay. what they do. Exactly. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the, the, our 2021 record store day release we did for the suite um, yeah. was uh, called Platinum Rare. And it was all rough mixes and demos, you know, from the 70s, you know, and the similar thing because they were all rough, they were off cassettes or, you know, right. tape, whatever. All it's all over. Place. And, and Scott made it smooth yeah. as all heck you know it sounded amazing on it sounded actually better on vinyl than it did on digital just because of of what it is you know and obviously mm -hmm. the digital is going to sound great but with the vinyl you're 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 getting that warmth that you know you never heard with these tracks so you know yeah. we had the rough mix of ballroom blitz and things like that and it just it came to life once it was put on vinyl yeah, and, and I'll tell you this, uh, one of the bands sent me a live version of one of the songs, and it was like truly live off the board, and Scott stripped the live sound and added crowd swell, and it just, it sounded like they were playing to a stadium. It was, it was just brilliant, because I, I, I heard the original, and I went, I can't fucking do, I can't use this. Sorry well, for the language. Scott mix or master it, or did he both? He does everything. He does whatever, he's like Jason, he does what, what the song requires. Yeah, he's well, no, there's a, there is a difference between mixing and mastering. Of course, that's, I was curious. Of course, of course. Yeah, but he Scott, does it all. Scott's, Scott's known as a uh, master. Master. yeah. yeah. mastering guy. Yeah. But yeah, he changed the crowd swell on this live song, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, it doesn't sound like it was recorded in a bar. It sounds like it's a stage. Anyway. <laughs> it sounds like the Enorma Dome, not the Brass Monkey basement. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but we love the Brass Monkey. It's a great place. Yeah. Uh, Jason, I could go on more, but I mean, this is great. Uh, pleasure to meet you and and uh, loving the new um the new ted I've, I've had linda you know i've heard a couple of tracks and it just sounds great it sounds yeah, great thank you, thank you. yeah yeah come and take it was the first single but you know i think people are going to be uh presently surprised by some of the other tracks yeah that's great absolutely there you go All right well uh thanks a lot man this is really cool to meet you in chat this is awesome yeah likewise uh thanks for uh, having me on guys yeah absolutely very informative and um to slowly try and convert mitch back into vinyl <laughs> I won't do vinyl. I'm a CD guy till till death do me part. That's uh, you know, or until Sony decides not to make CDs anymore. One of the two, right? <laughs> Whichever comes first, or you die. Well, yeah, it could happen. You could never happen. know. Anyway, uh, always a always a pleasure, uh, Jason. And let, let's do more. And I, I'm curious about how you, the, the you're going to move forward in the business on the side of Orchard. And please send us some of those Orchard artists over. Let's let's talk to them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Prudential Music Group Group dot com. You know, we got all of our stuff, and I definitely can get uh, Andy Scott from the Suite on there for you. I, I actually interviewed Andy two weeks ago. Oh, awesome! Perfect. And he was great. Yeah, Andy. Andy's a trip. A uh, absolute legend. Yeah, absolutely. I I fully agree. Thank you, sir. Yep. Awesome. Thanks so much. All, All right. See you. see you later, man. Peace. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. So